All right, folks, let's get started. Let me open us in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this church. Thank you for Disciple Life. Thank you for uh, the creation science topic. Uh, you're the creator, God. We just praise you and marvel at your works. Now we just continue to do that this evening. May everything that's said in this church and in this room tonight be pleasing and uh, a blessing to those who are here. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I just, I realized I made a bunch of changes on my presentation this afternoon as I was getting ready, and then I realized I didn't copy it over to this laptop, so I'm having to wing it from last year's presentation without the updates, but that'll be okay. I think it's, it'll work just fine. Dinosaurs, ape men, ice age, those are the topics tonight. We're kind of batting cleanup. Neither, none of these topics really deserve an entire hour so we'll just kind of hit on all three as we move along here. Uh, actually, I used to, to have these in two different hours. Uh, the dinosaurs and Ice Age, I used to cover one night, and the ape men had an hour by itself, but uh, I figured out how to consolidate it into one, one hour's uh, uh, topic. So that's what we're going to do tonight. That'll leave room for next week when we talk about quantum physics and this weird world we live in and all that. It's kind of a, 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 kind of a fun topic to kind of close the course off with. But uh, everybody wants to know about dinosaurs. Any homeschooling moms or families in here? Yeah, I mean, if you've got little boys, they all want to know about dinosaurs and get the little toys and everything. And, and uh, you know, you learn about them in school. And when did they live? I mean, the last dinosaurs that roamed on the earth, according to the textbooks, were 65 million years ago. And uh, so let me ask you a question. Did man and dinosaur ever live together? Yes, What's your evidence for that? Sometimes there's a cracking of a man. Oh, what, no, well, I know what you're talking about. The Pol Paluxy River Basin. That's actually, I'm not so sure about that one. It's an interesting one, but it's, it, I think that one's kind of a hoax. But uh, uh, anyway, the Bible. God says he created all the the people and the mammals and so forth that walk on the land and things like that on the sixth day. And so if God created the dinosaurs on the sixth day and God created man on the sixth day and Adam named all the animals, well, of course they, they lived together at some point in time. But according to the uh, evolutionary theorist and so forth, man didn't show up on the scene until two million years ago. So it's impossible in their scenario for man and dinosaurs to have walked together. Now, they, they categorize it into the late Triassic and the Jurassic and early Cretaceous layers is where they find the dinosaur fossils. You know, it, it hasn't been until maybe 100 years ago that they started finding dinosaur fossils or even knew what they were because they were all buried uh, under, underground. But now that they've discovered them, there's no question these dinosaurs uh, existed. Uh, we, uh, let me ask you another question. Were dinosaurs on the ark? Yes. Yes, they were, sure. God wanted to preserve all of uh, the, the living creatures and so forth. Now, obviously, they have gone extinct since then. Something caused them to, to disappear. Um, but we'll, we'll see what, uh, uh, and I'm sure that Noah didn't put the big ones on there, right? He would have put the little babies or whatever, or teenagers anyway, the ones that had a good chance of, uh, of uh, reproducing after they got off that ark. Um, but perhaps the Ice Age had something to do with getting rid of those dinosaurs. We'll see about that in just a, a moment here as we get into the Ice Age. Um, so when, well, we already answered this question, dinosaurs were created on the sixth day. Well, at least the walkers were. The swimmers and the flyers were created on the fifth day, right? And so uh, the, the, those are the dinosaurs, according to the Bible, days five and six. All right, let me ask you this. Were they warm-blooded or cold-blooded? That's a good, good answer. That really is. Uh, the, the, most people think, you know, would, would kind of quickly answer that they were cold-blooded because they were, quote, reptiles, right? You always think of dinosaurs as being reptilian. Matter of fact, I've heard it said a, new, a number of times, well, the reason they got so big is because reptiles never stopped growing. And if they lived, you know, for such a long time, then they must have just continued growing and gotten so big. Well, you know, I, I think this answer that they were both uh, warm-blooded and cold-blooded is correct because all the cold-blooded animals, the gators and so forth, all, you know, waddle and squirm. You know, they, they kind of crawl on the ground and so forth. Uh, but dinosaurs walked erect and upright. I mean, they had the big, kind of like mammals and so forth. 
and they've discovered some other evidence related to their heart, uh, that it was a four atrium, a four chamber heart with a single aorta and things like that. And so these are all characteristic of warm blooded animals. And so uh, uh, I, I think there were some probably cold and some probably warm blooded, but uh, I don't think they were reptiles necessarily. Uh, what about the fossils that you find these dinosaurs? Yeah, now, can you date these fossils, by the way? Well, the fossils are really rock. And how did they get to be rock? Is because all the bone disappeared and got replaced by the silica and the uh, carboniferous material and so forth that got in there the, 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 um, and turned into rock. And so you, it's not like a sedimentary rock or anything like that, so you can't date it. It's, it's not a once living thing. So fossils themselves, unless they have some, some remaining bone left in them, uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't date them with the carbon-14 dating because there's no more carbon uh, in there anyway. It's all rock at that point. So, but they find all these different, they find tons of fossils, by the way. You, you can uh, see bits and pieces scattered about all over uh, the world. Um, and that, that's how they usually find them is in bits and pieces. They find these little fragments and so forth and they can, you know, try to put them together and make a little part of a larger bone. And, uh, but they found some actually complete dinosaur skeletons with articulated joints and things like that. And so the ones you see in the uh, Field Museum of Natural History and up in Chicago and things like that, they, I mean, by and large, though, the, that's what they looked like, um, those dinosaurs. So they were absolutely huge. Sometimes they find skin impressions in the fossils where the skin itself has been fossilized. By the way, that's a clue to the fact that they, they got uh, fossilized very quickly, that it was a very quick process to fossilize them, not in millions of years. So it indicates a rapid burial if you can find fossilized skin impressions of those dinosaurs. So what happened to the dinosaurs when they got off the ark? Uh, you know, they, the world certainly must have been dramatically different than it was before. Where if it was a lush tropical environment, uh, when Noah and his animals got on that ark, uh, when they got off, it must have looked like a barren, stark, perhaps Martian type environment, you know, where there's hardly any plant life. You've got a few of the seeds and starting to, to, to germinate and, and, and uh, come up, but uh, by and large, the world is very different. And so they're going to be uh, kind of competing for food that's out there. But the scientists have some really crazy stories about uh, what happened to the dinosaurs. They don't know what, what caused them to go extinct themselves. Here are some of the theories. They think some of them perhaps starved to death, that there wasn't enough food around. And then you can actually find another article that says that they overate and ate too much food and, 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 and died because of odor overeating. And then some of them have suggested even that they were poisoned, uh, that something in the atmosphere caused them to be poisoned. One article I found uh, said that they became blind from cataracts and couldn't find each other to be able to mate. That's a, I mean, these are serious scientists suggesting these kinds of things. And uh, somebody said that they committed mass suicide. You know how they all run off the cliff and things like that, the, the lemmings into the sea. Another one suggested even that there was a leafy plant laxative material that used to help them keep regular and that, that particular plant went extinct and so they all died of constipation. So I mean, <laughs> they're desperately looking for reasons to, the reason for why these dinosaurs went extinct right here. Um, it's obvious that they really don't know what happened and they're grasping at straws. One of the, I think probably the most popular theory now is that it was a meteorite that hit the earth and, and uh, uh, caused them to go extinct uh, as a result of that cataclysmic event. But here's this uh, Alan Chang uh, in a book called The New Look at Dinosaurs. He says, every year people come up with new theories on this thorny problem. The trouble is that if we are to find just one reason to account for them all, it would have to explain the death all at the same time of animals living on land and animals living in the sea. And so he says they're not going to find one theory because they can't find, figure out one theory that would explain all of that. Oh, by the way, I got a theory. What happened about 4,500 years ago? A giant flood all at one time on the sea, on the land, covers the whole thing. It's problem solved. Right here. So you've got creationist uh, reasons for extinction after the flood as well. The, uh, uh, the creation scientist has to come up with their theories as to why these dinosaurs uh, may have gone extinct. And as I've just alluded to, I think most of them probably were buried in the flood, just like most of all life was buried uh, in the flood. And the ones that went on the ark went extinct for one reason or another. Uh, perhaps it was competition for food. 
uh, that was no longer in abundance. Perhaps uh, the weather changed so dramatically, like an ice age or some sort of hostile climate would have uh, caused them to be uh, 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 adverse conditions for them and caused them to go extinct. They, we see animals going, going extinct is not an unusual thing. We see that happening every year. And also, Genesis 9, 6 says that uh, the animals and man could now eat meat. Okay, so now they're eating each other, right? And so, I mean, there's a lot of competition for food going on. Man is now a hunter, so animals fear man. Man fears animals. And uh, perhaps the destruction of their habitat could have had something to do with it. Probably happened all in the first few hundred years after the flood. Um, but you know what? We don't find just fossils that tell us about the dinosaurs, but we have a history, uh, perhaps the faded and corrupted memories of people that saw dinosaurs at one point in the time, past. Um, because if Noah and the animal and, and his family got off the ark and they began to uh, have uh, descendants and so forth and there were still some dinosaurs around, you might expect to find some historical evidence at least written down or, or whatever of these, uh, of these creatures out here. And so there are a few artifacts in the history of the world that might suggest that dinosaurs were around. For example, here is the uh, a Babylonian cylinder uh, quite old, uh, the picture of a winged creature. Uh, now this is obviously a motif of some sort, but you've got a man fighting against a, uh, a dragon of sorts right here. Um, here's another uh, thing from Egypt. Uh, you've got a couple of real long necked uh, critters right here. I guess they're kissing. I don't know what that, what that picture is of, but uh, uh, it's a slate palette from uh, someplace in Egypt. Um, it, then you've, oh, there's a uh, close up, uh, oh another one, another one with long necked uh, motif of, of dragon type, type animals right here. And then you've got uh, out in the west, you've got these Indian pictographs that uh, it's hard to see this little animal right here. I'll show you another close up of that. Here is it chalked in on the, on the left hand side. Now this is, ha I happen to find this picture in a textbook uh, a school textbook for children, and uh, isn't it interesting? It's almost exactly the same creature, right there, same shape and size and form and everything, uh, like that. But uh, there's this dinosaur that's supposed to have lived. But you know what? Indians don't draw pictures of things they've never seen. You know, I mean, maybe they do have a good imagination, but I mean, it's got to be based on something. Uh, Natural Bridges State Park. Here's another uh, uh, place where you see this, this dinosaur in the picture, and here it is chalked in again over on this side uh, right here. Uh, back, uh, that dates back to around uh, 400 A.D., they say. Um, the aqua rock art. Uh, here's at, at Lake Superior Provincial Park in Ontario. Uh, you've got uh, this unusual looking ribbed creature like this. Uh, now, interesting, down in South America, they've got these Ica stones, and there's like 50,000 of these stones that they have found in Peru and, and places like that uh, since the 1961. So here, here you've got these, these, I mean, this looks like a Triceratops right here and then a Stegosaurus. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what they, were, what, what they were drawing, but here's another Ica stone of an, of a, of an Indian-like person, you know, up on a long neck. I mean, that's not a horse. That's got a real long neck right here uh, like that. Um, there it is chalked in, you can see it. Uh, here's another picture of an Ica stone uh, with, again, the, 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 the razorback, whatever motif you've got right there. Now, let me ask you this, why does the Bible not mention dinosaurs? I mean, that ought to be our primary document uh, if dinosaurs existed. Anybody? Yeah, because they're called dinosaur. something else. Do you, if you got a concordance, would you be able to find the word dinosaur in there? Yeah, there's just other words. The, the word for dinosaur wasn't coined until 1941. And uh, that's way after when the Bible was written. And so you wouldn't expect to find the word dinosaur. But you're exactly right. The, the, the uh, word for behemoth and leviathan and, and probably one of the most popular words in the Bible or, or about animals is dragon. You find dragons all over in the Bible. So yeah, it's, it's all through there. So uh, those three uh, creatures right there. And uh, the Bible doesn't mention every single type of animal. Either, but every single type of what? No, you're exactly right. So you wouldn't expect every animal to be in there. 
but uh, it does talk about behemoth, interestingly enough, and it's probably got the, the best description of any animal in the Bible is about behemoth. I mean, it's probably the most descriptive of, of any. If the Bible describes anything in the animal world, this one's probably the most prolific description right here. Uh, Job 40, verse 19 says, the behemoth is chief of the ways of God, the biggest land animal God had created. There it is, uh, 40, 15 through 18. I look now at the behemoth, which I have made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now, his strength is in his hips and his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit and his bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. So pretty interesting description uh, of this animal. You're trying to get a mental image of what this thing might have looked at. Now Job, by the way, was a descendant of Shem, and so we know he had to be post-flood and uh, after the flood, and so uh, God's describing this, uh, this behemoth to him. Um, and, uh, you know, um, many of scholars have suggested that this might be a hippopotamus or might be uh, an elephant or something like that. You know, you got the stomach muscles, the strength in the hips and everything, the bones like beams of bronze and the ribs of iron and things like that. Yeah, it starts to, to fit with those animals and everything. But it also talks about a tail like a cedar. Maybe a cedar twig, right? Uh, an elephant tail doesn't really fit like a, a big cedar. When the Bible talks about cedars, it's talking about the cedars of Lebanon, which are giant, you know, those were the, 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 the trusses and the beams across the temple uh, that David used and everything. So these are giant, uh, the thick logs that you would expect to see. All right, so maybe a hippopotamus will work. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not certain that one works either. That little squirty little tail on the end of that thing. Um, so how big were these dinosaurs, by the way? All right, now there's, 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 here's a fella. I guess he's six feet tall or whatever, and so he's got this thing going up maybe, what, uh, uh, 10 feet or so, uh, like that. That's, that's a pretty big, big animal. But well, wait a minute. Let's see him go. It's not all of it. It goes up some more. So you got these dinosaur bones. What is he now? At, uh, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35 feet or so tall right there up up to the shoulder I mean his neck's going up from there right so this thing is a giant creature right here this uh, this di uh, dinosaur and everything now there, here's the whole picture right there by the way so this is this quite an animal right there um, but you remember you remember the, the big dinosaurs I showed in that first picture that we saw at least the illustration whatever had the big the big tail out there that would be more like a tail of a cedar here so the Bible does perhaps describe these very types of creatures like this. Now, uh, let's move from the dinosaurs and talk about the Ice Age, because perhaps the Ice Age is what caused them to, to get rid of, uh, to, to, be, to, to disappear like that. So, now this is another perplexing thing for the scientists, the Ice Age, because the cause of the Ice Ages are a mystery to them as well. You, you, how do you have both a cold climate and lots of evaporation at the same time. Because when it gets cold in the wintertime, it, things dry up, right? I mean, everything in your house starts to get dry, you know, and you start worrying about dry nose and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, yeah, we get some rain and stuff like that, but, but basically the air is much drier in a cold climate. And in order to get an ice age, you've got to have a ton of evaporation. You've got to move water from the oceans over to the land and dump it down in the forms of snow and snow and snow, and it can't melt. And it's got to build up year after year to make glaciers and things like that. So you've got to have tons of evaporation, and you've got to have a fairly cold uh, climate. And those two do not go together, and uh, they're, they're having a difficult time figuring out what caused all these different ice ages. They think there were many different ice ages, by the way, as opposed to just one. The creationist theory would be that there was one great ice age. So global cooling uh, is not enough. Uh, that gives you less evaporation and less snow. So what's, what's the deal here? Um, we're going to talk about a flood-induced ice age. Well, how could the flood trigger an ice age? Well, during the flood, you would have had the warm waters. Remember the fountains of the great deep breaking up and, and that's all underneath the earth and very hot and everything. So the, the waters of the ocean are going to be very, very warm 
uh, not probably not boiling or anything like that, but they're going to be definitely a lot, a lot warmer than they are today. And so warm oceans are going to give you plenty of evaporation and uh, also give you a little bit of warmth in the wintertime. You're going to have uh, warmer winters, actually, still below freezing, but not just, you know, like Siberian tundra for cold or anything like that. So you're going to get lots of evaporation off the warm oceans. And because of all the volcanic activity going on as a result of all those continents moving around, the mountains being formed and everything, you get a lot of uh, volcanic acids and, and aerosols up in the atmosphere, which would reflect the sun away from the hitting the earth. And so the earth would be cooler in the summer. So you're going to get cooler summers as well as warmer winters. And so that's an ideal scenario for getting lots of evaporation and then not allowing the snow to melt uh, down in the summer because they're going to be, be cooler like that. And so no, no summer melting like that because it's, it's going to reflect the sunlight. And your ocean levels will probably drop as a result of that uh, because all that ice is being moved over on top of the land. And by the way, what does that do? Uh, how do you get animals to Australia, by the way? You know, if Noah and his brood landed on the, uh, you know, somewhere around Mount Ararat or whatever, you got to get animals all over the world at some point in time. They got to get over to North America, down to South America, and all that kind of stuff. And if there, you know, if there's no land bridge of some sort, they can't migrate there over the next uh, several hundred years after the flood. But if their land bridge is connecting all these continents, which is ideally suited for an ice age, because that's that's when the oceans drop, you get land bridges. They can now migrate over there. Now the oceans come back up when the ice age uh, retreats, and uh, so now you've got these islands formed. Uh, and so forth. So interesting uh, a scenario like that. So it has a lot of explanatory power when you look at it like that. Oh, uh, it's right back here. You've got that uh, visitor form right there? It's, he's got it back there. Thanks. Uh, so uh, does the Bible have any evidence of an ice age? Well, it's got evidence of dinosaurs. Well, it also has evidence of an ice age. Job, again, is... A, a book that describes an ice age fantastically. I mean, it's, it's, it's a perfect description of ice age. Here in Job 37, 9 through 11, it says, from the chamber of the south comes the whirlwind and the cold from the scattering winds of the north. By the breath of God, ice is given and the broad waters are frozen. Also, with moisture, he saturates the thick clouds and scatters his bright clouds. God's describing the perfect kind of climate and atmosphere the form an ice age right here in the book of Job. Job 38 says, uh, and this is God questioning Job. You know, Job wanted to ask God a few questions. Why would you do all this kind of stuff? And God said, wait a minute, I'm going to ask you the questions. God's the one that does the question asking around here. And so he says, where were you when I formed? And so he's asking, he's asking Job, have you entered the treasury of snow or have you seen the treasury of hail? which have reserved for the time of trouble from the day of battle and war. So another treasury of snow reference right there. Job 38 again uh, says, From whose womb comes the ice and the frost of heaven? Who gives it birth? The waters harden like stone and the surface of the deep is frozen. Now he's talking about, you know, ice age covering oceans and things like that, like up in the Arctic Circle and things like that. So. Uh, Great description. So lots of evidence for an ice age that fits with a global worldwide flood right here. Now we need to talk about the woolly mammoths because that's another question. Um, no doubt Noah had some little baby elephants, woolly mammoth type of creatures on the ark and uh, they made it out here and flourished because they have found millions of bones of woolly mammoths all across the world, particularly across Siberia and so forth. Uh, how did these woolly mammoths flourish so well after the flood? Uh, because, uh, uh, well, they're, they're, just trust me on that, they're post-flood uh, deaths. Uh, they didn't die during the flood. These particular animals didn't because they're on top. And, um, and they're not buried in rock like that. They're actually buried in dust, layers of dust and so forth. So it's an odd, odd sort of thing. And they're in a frozen tundra as well. Uh, now, contrary to popular belief, the woolly mammoths are not all frozen in ice. Now, they did find one completely put together mammoth frozen in ice. ice. And so that's the, the, the story that's come out. And, and they did find in his stomach, you know, some, some actually undigested food and things like that. So th that part of the story is true. 
but that's only one exception out of all of them. Most of them are just millions of scattered bones around and uh, they're not found in flood sediments. They are found in superficial sediments, uh, like wind-borne sediments and, and, and things like that. And they're found on top of a rocky substance, a rocky substance called glacier till. And so they are on top of the, the so the glaciers had to come down. When the glaciers move forward, the, the, the nose of the glacier comes out and it pushes the rocks out in front of it, okay? And so when it recedes, it leaves this, this trail of rocky till, rocks all over the place, and that's the evidence of a glacier. They can know exactly where the glaciers were because of that. They find the bones on top of this stuff. And so it had to be after, after the flood and everything. And they find them in the uh, superficial sediments of this glacier till material. And uh, they find them in Europe and in Siberia and in Alaska, uh, Canada and so forth. Uh, these animals could not have survived the winters of at least modern day Siberia. No way, because they're huge animals. They require massive amounts of vegetation in order to be able to, uh, to survive. So what happened to this ice age? Well, there, you know, it built up probably over a, a matter of uh, several hundred years, but this retreating ice age is due to warmer summers, not cooler summers, colder winters where there was less evaporation because the oceans are now starting to cool off and not evaporate as much. You know, after several hundred years, you'd expect that to happen, and very dry uh, types of climates. And so, a uh, good explanation for this. Now, the food that they found in the stomachs of these woolly mammoths were, by the way, uh, particles of daisies and uh, grasses and things like that. And so they had to live in some sort of prairie environment with lots of grass up in Siberia. And uh, their anatomy and physiology, like I said, requires lush prairies, uh, vast prairies, to, to uh, and, and an ice aged environment would be ideal for growing these types of uh, massive amounts of uh, vegetation because it's moist. You know, the hot summers won't burn it up. It'll be fairly cool in summers, but fairly warm in the winters, relatively speaking. And uh, uh, plenty of moisture from the, from the ice, retreating ice and so forth. So the, the, the mammoths are gonna do very well. But after the ice age finally retreats and the prairies start to dry up, these mammoths are gonna be in trouble. And there's a gentleman by the name of Michael Ord. He's a climatologist, he's uh, retired now, but his theory is that there must have been a giant windstorm because the climate's changing, and then it probably blew all of this dust, it turned into a dust bowl, and the dust just absolutely enveloped and swamped these animals as they were herding, and uh, covered them up, buried them, in that, uh, and that's the very kind of stuff you find them buried in. And so this is what, this, is, this perhaps solves the mystery of what happened to these uh, these woolly mammoths in a wind-blown silt storm, so to speak, resulting from the proper conditions of the retreating ice age. Okay, so that, that kind of explains the woolly mammoths. Now let's take the rest of our time tonight to talk about ape men. Uh, you always see the news about the most recent discovery. Uh, for example, you see, here's Time Magazine, How Man Evolved. And of course, there you've got your uh, uh, subtitle, Amazing New Discoveries, Reveal the Secrets of Our Past. And uh, you've got some, uh, a skull here of this, of this ape looking creature right here with the round eye sockets, that's typical of an ape like this. Uh, and then Newsweek and National Geographic will get involved in this as well. Here's time again, uh, showing the anthropologist Richard, Richard Leakey. You'll see this Leakey name over and over again of a family of, 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 of uh, scientists or, or paleontologists who uh, tend to, to track down these kinds of things. He's got this creature named Homo habilis with him. Now this is an artist, artist rendering. He didn't find this thing like this. An artist drew a picture of him and in in this thing that he supposedly found. Uh, how man became man. And of course you've got uh, this interesting looking fella uh, here uh, next to him that's supposedly one of your uh, great great grandparents. And then uh, here is the Time Magazine again with this brutish looking fella. How man began, fossils from the dawn of humanity are rewriting the story of evolution. See, these are the big stories. I mean, if you, if you find the hominid as a scientist in, in doing this stuff, you have written your ticket for the rest of your life to go to any university you want, to have any kind of speaking engagement you want. 
asking any kind of fee you want to do these things. And so all of them are searching for this claim to fame of finding the missing link, how apes became human. And uh, uh, I mean, that, they've got all kinds of, of stem cells up here. Gary Condit, you remember him? He's solving this issue of time right here. Uh, what a new discovery tells scientists about our oldest ancestors, how, how our oldest ancestors stood on two legs and made an evolutionary leap. See, that's the big thing. That's what they say really separates apes from humans is the fact that we walk, we're bipedal, we walk on two legs. And if they can find evidence of some kind of critter that, that, that would have been you know, a common ancestor, that would be the, uh, the missing link if they, if they could find evidence that it walked on two legs. So that's what they're looking for. Here's one more. Uh, this is a pleasant looking guy. Nice smile, nice teeth. Uh, the first pioneer, a new find shakes the family tree. And uh, interesting. Now we'll, we'll see about these artist renderings here in just a minute. But uh, of course, walking upright is like I said, what, what the, the main physical difference that they're looking for and looking for this is the evidence of the missing link. And, you know, more importantly, what's the difference between man and ape? I mean, yeah, we share a lot of the same genes and chromosomes together because we've got a lot of similar body parts and God's a good, efficient designer. He's gonna reuse stuff that, he can, that he's made before, like you'd expect to find uh, a brilliant design like that. But more importantly, man has an eternal spirit, right? I mean, that's God made us in his image and man has an, a, a moral choice uh, to make, unlike the apes. Um, Here's the chart of human evolution. You start over with this little critter, Pliopithecus here, a little tiny guy, uh, work your way up uh, to the Australo Australopithecus right here. This would be Lucy, uh, that's the Australopithecus right here. So you've got all these interesting names like Dryopithecus, Oreopithecus, Ramopithecus, and so forth. Pithic Pithecus means ape, so that's, that's the, what that means. And then here's Homo erectus, here's the first, I mean that's our that's our great granddaddy right there. Early Homo sapiens, Solo man, Rhodesian man, Neanderthal man, and Cro-Magnon man, and finally modern man with his golf clubs, his tools. <laughs> I guess those are golf clubs. That's what they look like to me. Uh, so anyway, you, you, it appears in this chart that you've got this smooth progression to go from ape all the way to man. And, and the, the funny thing is that you'll see how there's no real no evidence of that whatsoever. But we're led to believe that there's fossil evidence for every one of these guys out here. Talk as if the whole chain was there and we're just missing one link of that chain. I think the whole chain is gone. Yeah. <laughs> some, some ancestors in your family, you're saying? <laughs> I understand. Now, the main ones are Ramapithecus. That's a very important one right here. You'll see that name a lot. Uh, uh, Australopithecus is an is a, is a important one. All these tongue knit, quit. I can't even say it. Tongue twister names add dignity to these, these guys here. Uh, you've got uh, the, the Java man, the Peking man. That would be Homo erectus over here. Uh, let's see, yeah. This would be the Java man, the Peking man, and so forth. Now, Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal man, I mean, these are just men, okay? They're kind of brutish looking, probably post-flood, the ones they describe in the book of Job, who had to live in caves and, and all that kind of stuff. They probably had vitamin D deficiencies and as a consequence, their bones were hunched over and, and things like that. And, uh, but uh, uh, because of the lack of sunlight after the, during that ice age, you'd, the sun would be missing and you wouldn't be getting any milk products, and so you'd have a vitamin D uh, deficiency like that. Uh, but all the bones that make up this entire history right here that they found, except for Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon, I'm excluding those, all the rest of them, you know what? how much fossil evidence we have? It wouldn't even fill up one coffin. One box, you couldn't, you, you wouldn't even fill it up. Matter of fact, you could take a, a large dining room table and take all the bones and spread them out across the entire table like that. That's, that's what they've got uh, uh, for the evidence like this. So it wouldn't fill one coffin. Now here are the dates of supposedly when these things lived. Ramapithecus is supposed to have lived 14 to 13 million years ago. And uh, here's the next most recent one, 3.2 to 1.9 million years ago. This is Lucy. We'll talk about Lucy a little bit more in just a minute here. And you, you get on down here to, uh, you know, modern man here, and it's just this last little blip here at the end, just the last couple of million, well, not even that. Here's two million years right here. 
uh, a couple hundred thousand years ago uh, in, for Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon man down here. So you got this huge gap of time that they'd love to fill up here. That's, they like this one right here because that's, that's supposed to be a, a key missing link right here, Lucy. And uh, so they really don't know a whole lot about this, this chain of evolution right here. As a matter of fact, you remember the Leakey family? Here's a couple of quotes from a couple of prominent members of this family who have been investigating uh, ape men for years and years. It's, he, me, Leakey says, it may never be possible to say exactly what evolved into what. Pretty scientific statement, I'd say. And then Richard, uh, uh, one of his grandsons, says, I think we're still doing a great deal of guessing. Now, see, there's a couple of honest moments these guys uh, have. Uh, but uh, Dave Pilbeam says, from uh, the Harvard University, uh, professor of anthropology there, he says, there's no, and I don't have a quote for this one up here, but he says, there's no clear-cut and exorable pathway from ape to human being. As to whether man evolved from chimps or orangutans or gibbons, the fossil record has been elastic enough the expectation is sufficiently robust to accommodate almost any story. Now, if you pick a story, we can make it fit with the evidence we've got. Uh, perhaps generations of students of human evolution, including myself, have been flailing about in the dark. Our database too sparse, too slippery for it to be able to mold to our theories. Rather, the theories are more statements about us and our ideologies than about the past. So another moment of, of reflection, honest reflection right here. So how do you make an ape man? What, what, what is an ape man? Half ape, half man, right? Yeah. So you, one thing, one way you can do it is you can start with an ape-like fossil and then kind of upscale it. Look, look for some evidence that makes it more hominid-like, more human-like, okay? So you upscale an ape by emphasizing one feature or another to try to make a man out of an ape. So that's one way you can do it. Or you can start with a human fossil and kind of downscale it. Say, oh, he's got big brows on his eyes, a flat nose, and you know, he's got a, uh, uh, his brain is smaller and everything, so he's more ape-like, okay? So here's, I mean, that, that's two ways of going about making an ape man right here. Upscale an ape, downscale a man. There's another way. You can go, you can combine parts of both. You can go to one location and get you a jaw, maybe a human jaw, and then go to another location and get you a skull of an ape and put them together and say, see here, we got an ape man. You know, there's no, real, no way to know whether these bones were from the same critter or not. You know, they could all have been piled there together and part of it be human and part of it be ape. That could be explained by uh, burial grounds or uh, uh, perhaps a eating ground and combined into a burial place. All kinds of reasons that you would find uh, them to be in a similar location like that. So, now, we saw all these pictures, by the way. Uh, these are called artist reconstructions. All those covers of Time Magazine and National Geographic and so forth that you see are really just artist renderings. Now they make a big impression, particularly on the youth that see these things. I mean, if they're going to look at a picture, they're going to remember that. They're going to say, yeah, that's definitely an ape man. But you know what? They only start with little fragments of the evidence. Um, the ape bones are fashioned to look like humans, and the human bones are fashioned to look like apes. And they add all this hair. Uh, the nose and the eyes, by the way, did they find any hair, nose and eyes? No, these are just imagination. Uh, ears, they, and, and the artists are working at the direction and the instruction of the anthropologist who wants it to look like a particular thing for his own purposes, for his own uh, propaganda. Here's a picture. So you got this real brutish looking ape man artist rending right here, but there's the evidence, three little bone fragments right here and you get this. <coughs> kind of amazing, right? And which one is the kid going to remember that's learning this in school? They're going to remember this picture, not the fact that there was only just three fragments of bone that produced it uh, like that. And so uh, it's wishful thinking so much. Uh, Ernest Hooten, uh, in a book called Up from the Ape, says you can with equal facility model on a Neanderlo Neanderthaloid skull the features of a chimpanzee or the lineaments of a philosopher. These alleged restorations of ancient types of man have very little, to, if any, scientific value and are likely only to mislead the public. And so again, this honest uh, reflection that they have. All right, so let's talk about real apes. Let's talk about them a little bit, what, what makes them different from us. They are, you know, you've got the kingdom, phylum, how's it go, kingdom, phylum, class, 
uh, order, family, genus, species, something like that. And uh, we are supposed to be of the order of primates, us and the monkeys, okay? So that's how they, they link us together. We're all primates. And the, what really a primate is just simply animals. Uh, that We are of the uh, kingdom animalia, the family of uh, mammalia, so we, you know, uh, breastfed uh, uh, children, uh, young. And uh, our teeth are what separate us as primates. They have, we have four incisors, two canines, and two molars each, or four, four, uh, uh, the number of molars each, and so that makes us, that separates us, makes us a, uh, a primate along with the other monkeys. We also are, are have two breasts, uh, as opposed to multiple breasts like a cow would have. Um, we have an opposable first digit, that's one of the key uh, differences of a primate. Uh, we have nails on our fingers instead of claws, like an animal does, and so the nails separates us as a primate. We have eye sockets, our eyes sit in sockets inside our skulls like this as opposed to sitting on the outside like this. And we are placental bearing young. We have a, uh, the, the womb of the mother has the placental and that's what's supposed to separate us as primates. All primates have these features in common. And then uh, uh, where we separate is, is in the, uh, uh, we are of the family hominid uh, so the primates go their direction and we separate off and we go down the hominid line and uh, pre-humans and humans uh, uh, all go into this and uh, and then we get into Homo habilis that's the genus and the species where the uh, Homo erectus and so forth and then finally you get to Homo sapiens which is modern-day man and that really means ourselves wise so you can tell who designed all these names and charts and everything because we're the wise ones, right? We get to do it. And so uh, we're one smart cookie is what that means. Now, uh, question to ask when they find a hominid because they're going to find one. There's plenty of motivation for any of these guys to find a hominid, right? I mean, they're desperately looking for them because, like I said, that's their ticket to success right here. And uh, they're seeing things with a different worldview as well, and so they have this motivation. A lot of clamoring going on in this, this area of, of, of scientific research here. And so what, the, here are the questions to ask when they do find one. When you see the next write-up in Time Magazine or whatever, you should ask these questions. What is the expected range of variation that you might expect to find uh, with this particular species right here? Uh, proof of this would be to take two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, and put them on an oval face, and how many different types of faces can you make out of that? Well, I'm looking at about 30 real different ones in this room already right here. I mean, everybody looks very different, you know, and uh, uh, so you can get a lot of variety even in, even in just that, but I mean, you take, suppose we go to a dig and, and, and find the bones of a three pound chihuahua in one location, and then we find the bones of a 200 pound Great Dane over here in another location, are we gonna conclude that these were both dogs? Not from just the bones. I mean, you wouldn't. I mean, it'd, it'd be crazy. Uh, to, but there's that much variety even in the species like this. And so, ask that question: What's the expected range of variation? And so that would give you an idea of how you can go all the way from something that looks kind of like an ape, but really is a man, looks kind of like a man, but really is an ape. You know, I mean, you can get a lot of variation even within it. So a lot of overlap in terms of the kind of things they're looking for, like teeth and facial features and so forth. Um, now, the other question you might want to ask is they, they, what they find in these digs are a lot of tools, okay? And so they assume if there's a tool there, it must have been, you know, some, somebody, or well, a man, okay? Homo habilis or whatever. And uh, somebody that's a, a tool-making uh, uh, animal or, or human. And, uh, but let's ask this question. Suppose that, uh, that we all go extinct and that a thousand years from now, aliens from outer space come to our planet and they land here in Memphis, Tennessee over close to Shelby Farms here and they want to figure out what used to be on this planet and so they start digging down and boom they find something. They find some chicken bones and some plastic utensils and they think wow this chicken must have been using or these bones the animal that had these bones right here must have been using these plastic utensils to eat something with, right? That's their conclusion, right? So the bones and the tools go together. Now what's the real story? 
it's somebody's picnic lunch. And the only reason they had the plastic spoons or forks there was to eat the slaw, which long ago disappeared. It had nothing to do with the chicken, because you ate the chicken with your hands. Right? So, I mean, you, there's all kind of ways to explain tools and bones in the same location. Typically, the tools were probably used to eat the bones that were, were there, okay? Or to kill them or whatever. So, part of the meal. So, that would be what you'd ask, was the creature part of the meal? Uh, because men in the past have eaten uh, primates and things like that. They still do it today. Um, all right, what are the physical differences between a man and an ape? Usually all you find are skull parts because a skull is kind of heavy and harder to, uh, you know, disappear or degrade or, or whatever because uh, it's more dense. You find a lot of teeth because teeth are hard and very dense and so you find a lot of those. That's typically what you find, a lot of the larger bones. But when they find these bones, they'll find, uh, you know, pelvic bones or femur bones and things like that. They can tell something about the posture of this animal. They can tell something about the way the animal walked, if it did uh, walk upright or all, at all. And uh, of course they find tools, like I said. But typically it's gonna be things like brain size. That'll be a, a, a feature that they are very interested in. Uh, the brow ridges, what kind of ridges you had above your eyes and so forth, were they ape-like. Eye sockets are important because on a human, our eyes are oval shaped, okay? An ape, they're just perfectly round sockets like this, and so that's what they're looking for there. The shape of the face, is it square or is it oval shaped? Uh, here's another experiment you can do. Uh, if you take your finger and put it right below your nose right here and go up, you're not going to be able to go up very high because you're going to hit the nasal spine right here. The bone right here on the, bone, on the front of it, you've got the cartilage, but the bone is right, right there below that, and so you, you won't be able to do that. On an ape, if you did the same thing, it would just go straight up. It'd never hit the bone because there is no nasal spine on an ape. It's just a, a couple of holes up there. And so you won't see that at all on an ape. An ape has got a shovel sort of face uh, as opposed to, a, to a, a rounded face like that. The dental arcade is important. You know, the shape of the teeth is it a parabola or a U-shaped, and that, that has a lot of, uh, here's a picture, uh, it's kind of ugly. But uh, here you've got, uh, I think this is, uh, this is ape and this is human over here. Uh, but you've got uh, different, uh, and tooth enamel. If your tooth enamel is uh, very thick, that means you're more likely a human or a hominid. If it's very thin, it's more likely that you're an ape. Uh, but are there, by the way, any apes that have thick enamel in their teeth? Remember the variability I said? That's one of the questions you should ask. If you find some teeth and you find thick enamel, you can't assume automatically that it's human because orangutans have thick enamel on their teeth. And so uh, uh, there is a variability even within the primates that do have uh, thick enamel. Uh, and then the posture or the gait, they can tell a lot about how the muscles attach to the, you know, from the uh, femur up to the pelvis as to whether, and in the way the pelvis is, the, the, the femur bone extends, for an ape, the bones extend straight down like this. For a human, they extend at an angle down like this. And that's why humans are able to walk in a straight line, you know, but apes have to go like this. They have to go, you know, apes, apes walk around like that because of the way, and they, that's how you, you didn't know I could walk like an ape, did you? Uh, and their muscles attach, so they have to swing their leg out like this as opposed to being able to just lift them straight up like that. The apes can't do that. And so that tells them a lot about that. So if you find, you know, like Lucy, who's supposed to have some of these features, uh, then uh, like being able to walk upright and so forth, see that's how they upscale an ape and make it more human-like. And so there's the missing link. So all these things. Now diet and disease will have effects on all these things. Uh, and, and they have built entire evolutionary scenarios around one tooth before. So let's take a look at this rogues gallery of, of, of folks. Here's Ramapithecus, by the way. And interesting, here, here's the whole creature right here, artist rendering, but this is all they found. And it turns out that they found, and this wasn't discovered until after they had already published it in all the books and everything, that half the jaw came from Asia and the other half came from India. <laughs> they just put them together. And because it was two halves, they could rotate it and make it bend just like they wanted it to be so that it looks like uh, more more human-like as opposed to more ape-like. And so uh, uh, the parabola would be, would be that way. Uh, and the jaw structure is actually closer to, uh, to, to man than an ape in, in that respect. 
but you find the same tooth and draw structure in baboons living in Ethiopia today. And since then, complete skeletons have been discovered, and so they, they know that uh, Ramapithecus was all ape uh, at that point. So, uh, now here's the uh, modern version of Ramapithecus. He's a, a gibbon or whatever. Oh, actually identical to the modern orangutan. Okay, so, um, I'll go I'll skip over that one, I don't have time. Here's Java Man, now, a fellow by the name of Eugene Dubois had a goal in life that he was going to find the missing link. I mean, he's, he went to, to Java, the island of Java, and he said, I'm going to, he told all his friends, I am going to find the missing link. And uh, he uh, produced this thing, and he called it Pithecanthropus erectus. And they found a piece of a skull cap. Oh, here it is, the skull cap. They found a jaw fragment, some a teeth and a femur bone here. And uh, uh, so there, this is all they found, the blackened bones like this right here. And uh, the facial characteristics on this thing are pure imagination because you, you just couldn't, you couldn't put that together from that in any other way. Now the parts he found were scattered over a two mile radius and he found them over a period of seven years. And so he put these things together, seven years over a two mile radius, these are the bones he found. And he put it all together, this is all he found, and, and that's Java Man. There was a brief public showing of this Java man. The world went crazy over it. And uh, the remains were locked up for 30 years, preventing any further scientific inquiry. Now, he later confessed, by the way, uh, and told uh, uh, that the skull cap was actually that from a gibbon. And he also admits that there were human skulls 15 to 20 feet away but he kept them hidden because he claims he didn't fully understand the significance of the human skulls out there. So these bones are definitely uh, human-like, and there is this a skull of a, uh, uh, a gibbon, right, like that. And so that was finally confessed, but believe it or not, Java Man is still in many of our textbooks today, even though he has confessed and said that it was all a hoax right here. Here he says, Pithecanthropus, or Java Man, was not a man, but a gigantic genus allied to the gibbons superior to its near relatives on account of its exceedingly large brain volume and distinguished at the same time by its erect <coughs> attitude. That was uh, Eugene Dubois. Now here, here's the Nebraska man. This is the one that became famous in the Scopes trial, by the way. Um, so here is, uh, she's very lovely. That's his wife right there, by the way. And uh, he's a kind of interesting looking dude too. So, uh, so here they are walking around and uh, this was supposedly found in 1950, no, I'm sorry, uh, in uh, 19, well, it was in the 1927 Scopes trial, I forget when it was found, but uh, after the trial, oh, I should say this, turns out all they found was a tooth. One tooth, that's it. You got the whole family from one tooth out here. And, uh, but after the trial, someone suggested that they return to the site where they found this tooth and believe it or not, they found the jawbone that went with the tooth. And the tooth fit perfectly inside this jawbone. But suddenly the enthusiasm of the scientists turned to dismay when they discovered that uh, the jawbone was from an extinct pig. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was the story of uh, Nebraska Man. By the way, if you go up to the University of Nebraska, they still have a statue of Nebraska Man out there on the campus up there. So. Uh, uh, Here's Peking Man, now not to be outdone by anybody else, the Chinese had to get in on this uh, missing link thing, so they uh, came up with this Peking Man in 1927. They found uh, some broken up bone scrap, uh, fragments of skulls. The lower, well, basically the evidence mysteriously disappear, disappeared in World War II, but they still use this thing in the textbooks today. Um, so they don't have the evidence for this thing, they just have the story that it was once there, uh, out there, out like that. So uh, there's Piltdown Man as well. This is the British version, okay? See, the Brits are not gonna be outdone by anybody. So you can tell that his hairstyling is a lot more cultured as far as an ape man is concerned than anything else. I mean, he, he looks kinda, kinda cool right there. So uh, he was supposedly was found in a pit inside in England, inside of a pit, and, uh, uh, and it wasn't long before uh, they bathed him up and, and, and elevated him to British nobility. 
Charles Dawson was the guy that found this thing and he announced to the world in 1912 that this was the missing link. But in 1953, the scientists finally made a critical analysis of the Piltdown Man and the teeth had been filed down to appear man-like, these molars, and the skull had been stained with this yellow ochre type stain and then filed away and turned out the whole thing was a fraud. And so, uh, I got another picture. So the skull bones were 100% human and the jaw fragment was 100% ape. So there's your true ape man, right like that. And he, he was a huckster anyway, Charles Dawson was, they found that later. And then finally, Neanderthal man. Now, they found this in 1856 in France. And they have confirmed that these ancient people uh, actually were not that stooped over, nor had they, I mean, um, they confirmed that these, they, they actually stood up straight and that maybe a few of them were stooped over. Uh, but the first skeleton they found was re-examined and the spine was curved due to bad arthritis. And um, the, re they, the research of this brutish appearance uh, that they have in their face and so forth was due to some sort of bone disease, uh, rickets or something like that. And again, that's vitamin D deficiency that you'd expect to see in a cold and damp and poorly sunlit environment that they were in. Okay, so um, I'm gonna, this is the, a, a verse out of Job chapter 30, the first eight verses, you can read that later because we, we've got we've to move on here and finish up here. Uh, but it describes Neanderthal man perfectly. They lived in caves and so forth uh, right here. They were driven out and had to uh, live in the cleft of the rocks and things like that. So these are completely humans right here, uh, these Neanderthal men. And uh, you can take the skull, skull bone of a, of a Neanderthal man and you can make it look like this brutish looking creature here or you can put a nice, you know, uh, modern uh, face on this thing. Now, Lucy is the final one. Uh, she was found in 1975 by Donald Johansson and you might notice that that was not a leaky. And so the leakies were very upset that somebody other than their family found a missing link out here, uh, Lucy. That's Australopithecus. She was about three and a half feet tall and uh, it was a stroke of genius to make it a girl. I don't know how they knew it was a girl, but I mean, she tugged on the heartstrings of all sorts of people because she was a, a, a lady. Uh, here's this lovely little Lucy right here. And uh, looks just like the skeleton of a modern chimpanzee, weighed only 50 pounds. And uh, she supposedly walked upright like a man. Now let me ask you this. Are there any chimpanzees today that walk upright like a man? Well, it turns out there are. The pygmy uh, chimpanzees wander around the rainforest and walking upright today. And uh, so yes, they do. Now, in 1979, the Leakeys finally saw their chance right here. Uh, Mary Leakey discovered a trail of 77 man-like prints called the Laetoli footprints. And uh, she tested the, the, the de carbon dated the lava flow that these footprints were found in and found that the lava was, th the was 3.6 million years old. That's right exactly around the age that Lucy sh uh, was. And so she concluded that obviously, they, and they were human-like footprints, by the way. She concluded that, well, these can't be human footprints because it's so old, right? And so it must be Lucy. <laughs> now she's gonna get Johansson back. And so this uh, uh, interesting little story between the families right here uh, kind of takes a different turn right here. And now in the London Museum, you can see Lucy, a picture of Lucy uh, with human feet. There's Lucy, a picture of her foot, you know, with all the hair and everything, and there's the human feet. And uh, she's even got a daughter now, Lucy's daughter. Uh, uh, there's her skull bone right here. And uh, they draw a picture of her. Cute as a button, didn't she? <laughs> But anyway, there, there's Lucy's daughter. So yeah, again, I mean, the leakies kind of get back in on the act. Now, uh, I need to skip over that one. Uh, right here, let me let this, let's let this be the last one. He says, in Newsweek magazine, it talks about leakies latest find, a battered skull unearthed in the western shore, shore of Kenya's Lake Ternanka, threatens to topple the one thing that we thought we knew about our earliest ancestors, that we are direct descendants of the diminutive species whose most famous member, Lucy, roamed East Africa 2.9 to 3.9 million years ago. 
And then this find says that the old notion of a single, almost biblical lineage in which Lucy begot Homo habilis, who begot Homo erectus, who begot Homo sapiens, is out the window. <laughs> so that whole story's falling apart, and now they're looking again. But anyway, that's, that's kind of the rogues gallery of the eighth men. So that's been it. Uh, next week is our last week on the creation science. We're going to look into uh, a strange world that we live in. There's a lot more to this world than meets the eye. We're going to look at quantum physics and uh, uh, multiple dimensionality and some weird stuff, but it'll be, it'll be fascinating. We kind of take that as a, 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 a week to just kind of explore and experiment on some things that, uh, that typically aren't talked about in a creation science class, and we'll have some fun with that. And so let's pray and be dismissed. Father in heaven, thank you for this evening. Thank you for, uh, uh, for creating us in your image. Thank you that you've uh, given us a way for the hope of heaven, Father. Uh, the difference between us and apes, Father, language. You've given us a way to confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead so that we might be saved and go to heaven. Thank you for that. We ask you to go with us to our homes now and bring us back to worship Sunday. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.